Welcome everybody, live back chat from Whippersnapper. Here we go, Scoey's getting into media land now, powered by Fleet Network. I'll just switch on, and I just just come into this different human being. We've got John Worsfold in the house. A big round of applause for John Worsfold. <laughs> now, Wusha, I know you're a big fan of back chat because you're a backman for most <laughs> of your career. Um, I'm going to get to that. But I want to ask you the first question we ask every guest. Every guest we've ever had on back chat gets the same question straight up. I want to know your greatest sporting achievement, not in football. We, we know you're a premiership captain. We know you're a premiership coach. We know you're a hard hitter. You're ruthless on the field. Not the smiling assassin. We know all that. Right? <laughs> okay, we, we know all that. Best and fairest winner with the West Coast. You're a, you're a club legend. You're a West Australian legend. It's an award named after him. There, yeah, that's, that's correct there. Yeah. But that's all in football. Yeah. I want to know what you can do on the sporting scope, not in football. Your greatest sporting achievement, not in footy. Have you got one that springs to mind? Um, yeah, the one, the, the story that I probably tell the most that bores people the most. Uh, but <laughs> Great. I love Great. Yeah, please start with that, Woosh. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Um, I played a game of A-grade cricket for Fremantle Cricket Club. Wow. Uh, and uh, I was the 12th man. And Jeff Marsh got the call up to go and play for Australia. So he couldn't field the second. He batted the first week. The next week he, he was unavailable because he had better priorities. <laughs> and I, was, I actually wasn't even 12th man. I'd retired from cricket. And I got a call saying, we need someone to come and field. We know you played last year. You've given cricket away. Do you want to come and field for the A grade? What so, year is this and how old are you? Uh, I was probably 18 or 19. Right. And um, I went up and fielded and, and took a match-saving catch on the boundary line. They fielded me on the boundary line, like way <laughs> out of the way. Uh, and the, the actual bowler, who was a very good cricketer, was Peter Sumich. Really? Bowling his spinners. Blokes try to smash him over the boundary line and I took a catch to one, give him a wicket and save six runs. So Huge. That's my greatest claim to fame. Yeah, yeah, very it's good. good. Yeah, 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 give that. I mean, it's no... Um, it's no five for 16 in a grand final, which is what I bowled. Um, under, that was under 12. Was a bit oh, like, I was going to say, bit, was bit, it A-grade cricket? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it was okay. Stuart Hill Cricket Club, yeah. uh, D-grade, I think. But we didn't even win the, win the game. So I, well, uh, I didn't yeah, save the game like you. I'm sorry. I was going to get a copy of the actual score sheet and it just said court sub. So it, <laughs> it really didn't do me any favours. I want to take you all the way back. Well done. Um, now, this is powered by Fleet Network. Of course, Whippersnappers stepping involved here, but Fleet Network power the podcast. What was your first car, Woosha? Can you remember your first car? I'm imagining, yeah. what, what sort of car do you reckon Woosha drove down? Like a, like a VL, Commodore VL. That's very upmarket for me, mate. My first car was a Mitsubishi Galant. Oh, the a little, Galant. Uh, little orange, little orange, orange. beast. Yes. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, the floor was rusted out. Um, <laughs> but that got me up to footy training and up to uni in the uh, early days until I graduated uh, when I became a really high-paid uh, footballer. In those, that, that first year at West Coast, I think I earned $18,000, but um, <laughs> that was enough for me to buy a brand new Camira, Holden Camira. Oh, wow. my God. Now you reckon I thought I was flash. <laughs> how, much, uh, how much money did you have left after that? <laughs> uh, I, I reckon I still had six grand left after that. That was only 12 grand brand new for a little Camira back then. That's unreal, mate. I want to take you back. So you talk about driving up to uni and footy. Um, John Worsfold was a kid. No, your brother Peter. Uh, he, he was involved at the footy club. What was What was... Growing up life at the Worsfold house? Uh, it was pretty much all sport, as you can imagine. I had an older sister who was a good netballer, but very good athlete. Um, so weekends were all about athletics, netball, football, cricket, basketball, whatever was going around. So just, uh, yeah, a heap of sport nonstop. Was uh, getting around, watching each other play and supporting each other. But um, then at home, yeah, we had the usual uh, backyard cricket, we had a basketball sort of set up on the paving, uh, which got pretty pretty heated at times. Pete, Pete's your younger brother. Yes. Um, so who who would win the fights? Who would who would? Uh, are you really asking that question, <laughs> Scotty? Seriously. <laughs> like, he used to tell me. He used to tell me he used to beat you. No, he he wouldn't. He wouldn't even be able to lie about that. Like. <laughs> um, yeah, no, we, we, we were pretty close, but uh, we had a couple of run-ins. And, um, yeah, one, he did whack me. He fed income, swung and gave me uh, like a right hook. He would have been 
12, I reckon, so I was like 13 and a half. <laughs> and then he just disappeared for like three hours. I was looking everywhere for him and I could not find him. He reckons he took off like three blocks away and just sat under a bush for a few hours until I cooled down. He, uh, he, he went on to play for Brisbane. Like he was a good footballer in his own right and you were at West Coast. You know, how was that dynamic? I mean, yeah, all pretty good. I mean, he... Um, he played 30-odd games for Brisbane over two or three three years, I think, and only ever played one game against him. So that was in uh, 1992, I think. Uh, no, 1990, yeah, 1992. We played Brisbane up at the up on Carrara on the Gold Coast. Uh, they were struggling, and we, we were coming off losing a grand final the previous year, but like expecting to be one of the top sides in the comp. So we went up there ready to smash them. Mum and Dad flew over. It was the first time the two brothers ever played against yes. each other, and uh, we come a draw. <laughs> Game really? was a draw. Really? Fair dinkum. And um, I think Mum and Dad ducked in the Eagles' rooms, and like Mick had just given it to us, and we were all like <laughs> devastated. <laughs> and they went into the Brisbane rooms, and they were cracking champagne and <laughs> celebrating. It was like it's the same result, <laughs> but totally different response. Did you match up on each other? No, but Pete tells a story that uh, something happened within the game that just rolled me. I'm not sure what, but I had a Brisbane player in an uncomfortable position. Like, <laughs> a headlock. Pretty much, where he was uh, <laughs> struggling to breathe. And Pete thought, I better go over and help my teammate out, but how's this going to go? It's my brother, and he's mad. <laughs> and um, Pete ran over, and as he got like two metres away, he said, hey, let him go. And he reckons I looked around and just let him go. <laughs> And that right. was it, yeah. It's like my brother said, ask me to do something, I did it. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, Pete <laughs> ran off. Like I probably <laughs> got the bloke back in a headlock. But, <laughs> yeah. um, just for that minute, I uh, obeyed. So um, you went way through South Fremantle uh, and, and into the inaugural West Coast side, starting a new football club. Like, what, what's, what's that like? Because, look, we've had some examples uh, of the past with Gold Coast and GWS, but the sides that have been coming in haven't been new. Like, you're a brand new football club. You don't have a club song. You don't have facilities. What's that no, like? We and, had, you were, uh, and you were young too. Yeah, I'd just turned 18 and they got the squad together for the first time. And uh, like three years earlier, I was wearing a number four North Melbourne Guernsey to footy training. Right. Um, and I'd done that for seven or eight years through my junior footy career. And Ross Glendening was my idol. Right. And he was the inaugural captain of West Coast. So I remember the first time we all came together, I was nervous. Like, really, it was only the other two South Fremantle players on the list uh, in Wally Matera and David Hart that would have recognised me, I reckon. Yeah. Um, anyway, I got introduced to Ross Glendening, and I was, just, I was pretty young. And uh, I remember going up to him myself to introduce myself and I actually said and this was stupid but <laughs> I went up and said oh g'day Ross I'm John Warsfold I'm one of the players <laughs> I thought he might have thought I was a water boy or something like that uh, and he said I know who you are you know uh, so that was a bit of a thrill to uh, to meet Ross but yeah we had there'd been no announcement of a name colours or anything so we we had no training kit we were just given plain uh, Puma shorts plain Puma T-shirts and singlets to train in um, at Aquinas College because we had no ground to train at. None of the waffle clubs were happy with this new club uh, mm. being formed to join the VFL comp, so they banned us from using their grounds. So we couldn't train at any waffle ground, including Subaco Oval. So uh, we were at Aquinas College and then at Mount Lawley Teachers College, which is now ECU in Mount Lawley. Um, that was our training base. Right. And the players you started with, like there was 32 of you, so... 35 on the inaugural list. Right. Yep. I mean, that's that's small. An AFL list probably looks more like 30, 42, 45. That's a small group of players. All West Australian, there's it's imports as well. Um, Very West Australian dominant, at least. Yeah, I reckon uh, pretty much. Uh, Jeff Miles was on the inaugural list. Uh, he was a Victorian, but was over here playing for Claremont at the time. Did it very early on feel like Western Australia versus the East um, Coast? Oh, to some degree, uh, but we were like I'd, we were just getting to know each other as well. Mm. Like we'd only I'd only played against a lot of these guys once in in one year of league footy with South Fremantle prior to it being formed. So we were actually all just getting to know each other and get ourselves together as a group. But um, yeah, at the time we had a list of thirty five. Every Victorian club, including Brisbane, who joined the same year, were, had lists of fifty two. So uh, they had a, a big list to choose from. Um, the VFL and their wisdom when they made the rules up, they said, well, you guys can have 35, that'll do you. Uh, see how you go with that. <laughs> um, 
uh, but we, you know, we, we became very tight knit, very close. We didn't um, get too phased by not having a ground to train at, um, by like having temporary home base. Um, took us a while, as I said, to to before we actually got any kitted out with any actual gear that felt like was it. We were now part of a club, and we had no idea about travelling every every week or every second week. And in in that first year or two, uh, we would be fixtured back to back games away. It was like no one really knew what they were doing. So, so were you in and out, like all you yeah, saying we would over come there? home. But yeah. the last uh, game of our first year, we played on a Sunday on the Gold Coast. And then we were fixtured to play in Melbourne on the Friday night. So it was like, one, it was a very short break. Yes. Thanks for that. And then it was <laughs> like, well, what's, we won't get back to Perth till late Monday night and we'll be back on the plane on Wednesday to go back. So we stayed on the Gold Coast for a, a Sunday night, Monday night, which was a mistake with guys like Chris Mainwaring and a couple of others <laughs> on the list. Um, and... Uh, then we went down to Melbourne and stayed in Melbourne um, Wednesday, Thursday, prepping for the game. So this is 86, 87. You win the best and fairest in 88. You lead the club in disposals, in marks, and in tackles. So I'm reading this, right? I'm doing preparation for this interview. John Worsfold, leading disposals, marks, tackles. You're a dour defender at stage of your career. Don't look at me like that because you're scaring <laughs> me, but you were. You were. You were, you were a hard-nosed defender. You're not running around getting a touch. 1988, you're a midfielder, John Worsfold. My, my, my defensive hero, I grew up watching John <laughs> Worsfold, the defender. You're a midfielder, weren't you? Well, I got all that rubbish out of my system early, <laughs> Scully, and then grew up, you know, and became a man and <laughs> went into the back line. The men's department so, in the back line. Absolutely. So you had to mature before they let you in. Down did, back. did you, you know, was that, you, you're a junior midfielder and, and, and played in there? And that's how Yeah, that my, whole, my whole junior career was playing as a midfielder. In, in those days, basically, you were called the centreman, played in the centre. Um, my first year of league footy with South Fremantle, I played alongside Mark Bairstow as a, a ruck rover alongside him. Um, he went on and won the Sandover medal that year. Uh, I think we looked the same. He must have got a few of my votes. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, I, yeah, I, was, I, I grew up as a running, a running midfielder. Um, and then when I started at West Coast, for the first two or three years, I played a fair bit through the midfield. Mm. What was the, the transition of like from Waffle to, to AFL or VFL footy at the time? Was it much different? Yeah, for us it was going from, for the majority of us who just watched VFL footy on telly with the winners, you know, on a Sunday night, um, we idolised those guys, but it always seemed so far away, so, so much a higher level. So all of a sudden when we were prepping to, uh, to play in the VFL, I just remember every week we were talking about the big names that we were going to be playing against, whether it was Dougie Hawkins or Robbie Flower, um, Peter Dacos. You know, every week we're going, oh, how good is this? <laughs> we're going to be playing against these guys and then going out to see who you were going to line up on and uh, talking about that after the game. So it was, yeah, it was uh, as much as we were there to compete and try and match ourselves against us, we were pretty much in awe of the competition for that first year or so. 88, your best and fairest. 89, your vice captain. By 91, your captain. Mick Malthouse is appointed coach. Sort of hand in hand, how, how that goes. Uh, how old are you there? 23? Uh, yes. Was a young, yeah. young captain. Did leadership come naturally to you or was it something that was forced upon you? How, how, how did, you know, it's, it's a young, young man becoming captain. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, my, you, you don't know what you're doing is leadership, but I worked hard, so I trained extremely hard. I never took shortcuts. I was diligent with everything I did. I followed, uh, like I supported the, the coaches in what we were trying to do, and I'd talk to other players, even as a young player, about what I thought was in line with what we were doing and what wasn't. I wasn't afraid to speak up if I didn't think people were abiding by what, what the values we were trying to uh, play by. Um, so those things were just happening along the way without me trying to be a leader. It was just who I was. Um, and then, yeah, Mick Malthouse, uh, well, being made a young vice captain, I think John Todd was coaching at the time, uh, but there was multiple vice captains at that point. Um, so I was one of them. Um, and then I think maybe the following year, a sole vice captain and then um, made captain at the end of, well, acting captain in the 1990 final series. Um, so at that stage, I was only just turning 20. 
uh, oh, sorry, 21, and um, and then made full time captain for the 91 season. Yeah. So, so you play in a grand final in your first year as full time captain. Yep. Lose it. Yeah, yeah. Can't remember that, I'm assuming. It wasn't my fault. Uh, <laughs> uh, players did not follow the lead uh, on that day, but um, I managed to uh, talk them into having another crack the next year. <laughs> so it was all you. You're an uh, early yeah. 20s captain for a grand final. Are you like, What's your rev-up speech like? Are you it's a giving good it question. to them? Yeah, my rev-up speech was... I reckon my teammates would have just been shaking their heads saying, <laughs> leave us out of that. You are mad. Like, we are not going to just go head first and try and knock everyone out. Like, we're, just, we're here to try and play footy. Um, so they would uh, sort of look at me and smile and uh, tolerate me and then say, let's just go play footy. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Sure I think this is like war and uh, we're just going to be punching on the whole game. But... 92, 94, incredible years for the football club. So you come off 91, you lose that. There's a saying in footy that you're going to lose one to win one. Um, you know, I, I play, played a part of a team that lost one and then won one. 05 lost, 06 win, 91 lose. It has happened, but do you subscribe to that? You've got to lose one to no, win one? No, obviously not at all. Um, when you're involved in that, it's sort of front of mind. You think, well, you do learn from, from those losses, but I'd much rather have won all of them you <laughs> yes. know, and not lost any. Um, but that was just the way it panned out. It, it, at the end of 1991, I've got no doubt, we were, we were a really young team that year, really talented and on the way up. Um, but it had been a pretty tough year. We had a tough finals series um, and that had come off a really tough year the year before where I think our last six games in a row we travelled for and we had the drawn final in, at the end of 1990 with Collingwood, the last final that you had to replay. Um, so that extended the season out for us and we, we were pretty banged up and exhausted by the end of that. We got ourselves up for 91, but I think being so young, we just tailed off towards the end of the year and had nothing left for the grand final. Um, mind you, we were playing a very hard-edged gun team in uh, Hawthorne at the very end of their um, unbelievably dominant era. So, yeah, 91 was um, a big learning year for us, but we had great belief. and um, But we got a bit of a wake-up call early in 1992 when um, we honestly felt like we we're going to be hard to beat in 1992 and I think at round seven we were three wins and a draw and one of those draws was that Brisbane game I was talking about but right. um, yeah we weren't traveling very well and uh, we sort of sat down and had a bit of a heart to heart after an away game in the rooms and set things straight and got back into action from there. 92 um I've had a few boys from the team tell a story. So a grand final day, I think you were doing maybe a warm up in the morning out at uh, whatever overly Gosh's paddock there at, at the MCG. Geelong fan, so I'm a Geelong boy wisher, as you know. Um, look, Geelong people, I love them. Cut from a bit of a different cloth to the most. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're a quite vocal bunch of supporters. They were giving you a, they, they'd rocked up at eight a.m. basically on the VBs. Here's yeah. his West Australian side. Throwing beers at you. There was, I, think, yeah. I think a beer landed in the group, didn't it? <laughs> Mate, it? No, it could have. Uh, we'll go with that. <laughs> yeah, um, thanks. I heard Maney scold a beer. <laughs> no, Game that's, day. That's getting a bit carried away. But um, <laughs> we were staying at the what was called the Hilton Hotel, which was opposite the ground. Um, and we'd gone to do a little warm-up. It was actually in those Fitzroy Gardens right next to yep. the... Um, uh, the hotel where we were staying. So we'd done a little warm-up through there and there were a few people around at that stage. But we got back to the hotel, we had a meeting and then we were getting ready to go over to the, ga to the ground at a, you know, about 11 o'clock, 11.30. And then Mick had told us uh, we're going to walk over to the change rooms. So to do that from the hotel, you had to walk through the whole car park uh, of the MCG when people were still allowed to park in all those parklands surrounding the ground. Yep. So we had to walk through there, and that's where people had been in there since 8 a.m., having their champagne breakfast, their, their tailgate barbecues, <laughs> drinking beers. So you imagine they'd, they'd been there since 8. We're wandering over about 11.30 in our bright blue and yellow <laughs> track suits. This group, we started off all sort of pretty relaxed and casual and spread out a bit. And after we got a few mouthfuls and people getting quite aggressive, we were in real tight, <laughs> like just moving like that and uh, starting to get the tempo up, thinking let's just get to the change rooms and, and get going. But we'll definitely be 
I believe, the only grand final team that had walked a kilometre and a half through the crowd, uh, the park car park, to get to the MCG for grand final day. Do you, do you think that's a strategic thing from Mick? Because he seems like that sort of guy that would plan that. Yeah, yeah, there would have been something deep in Some Mick's lesson. Death, so like, <laughs> I hope people come and have a go at us. Like, let's <laughs> see the boys fire up. But, um, and, and they were quite vocal, you know. They were uh, death threats, as in, uh, Ablett's going to kill you, Matera. You know, sort of <laughs> things like that. And... Uh, all those things were, were going on. Um, so we look back on it fondly, but, uh, yeah, it, it, it was on edge. It really was. Who did you play on that day? Ablett. Yeah, I played on Ablett. So Peter Matura is looking at me when he's hearing that going, you're not going to let that happen, <laughs> are you? Wish I please. Because <laughs> he kicked one that day. One nah, one. I think he kicked two or three, actually, but... Not on you. Like, one of them in dead time, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, Don't I, was, I know what that's like. Don't I think I was over hugging Jacko because we were going to win and he snuck <laughs> off and kicked a goal. And I'm like, mate, cares? But anyway. So, and the man that's come from the midfield, one of the best and fairest as a midfielder, 92, captain, you've transformed yourself into a man and playing in the back line against Gary Ablett, who, my childhood hero, everyone in Geelong's childhood hero... Is that intimidating coming in against that, or are you, are you taking it to him? You, you look at him in the eye and taking it right up to him. It's pretty nerve wracking, yeah. but not intimidating. It's like um, all you can do is go out and have a crack, do your best. Like you know how good he is. He's the sort of guy that can keep ten goals on you if you're not on. Yeah, well, all week leading up to that game, the media stories were about uh, Gary Ablett's going to be a key player in this game. And his last grand final, he kicked nine goals and won the Norm Smith medal. So I'm reading all that going, oh, yeah, I'm going to stop reading the paper because all you kept reading was how good Ablett was. Um, yes. You know, and the fact that he was a bit stronger than me and a bit bigger than me and jumped way higher than me and kicked the ball on both feet 15 metres further than me, uh, I wasn't that daunted. <laughs> I was like, I'll just have a go. But, um, yeah, look, I, I had played on him before uh, and I knew what I was up against and what you rely on is obviously uh, good pressure from, from the rest of the team and maybe Peter Matera kicking a lot of goals off the wing <laughs> keeps the ball away from me and Ablett, which was n nice and handy. Did you get him in 94 as well? No, I think Michael Brennan played on him in 94, right. yeah. And in 94, he had, uh, he, he had an unbelievable year and I think Monkey kept him either goalless or... He kicked one. Or to one, yeah. Monkey did a brilliant job that day. You, but, didn't, you I mean, didn't want him? Uh, yeah, no, Mick was sort of like that. Um, roles had changed. Michael Brennan actually played centre forward in 1992 um, because he'd been injured and came, like, he was such a key part of everything we'd built up. Um, Mick squeezed him into the team in the forward line. Um, huh. But by 94, he was back as a solid key, key part of our back six. And, um, and he took Ablett. They, they blew him. McKenna had played on Ablett a number of times as well. Um, so it really depended on the mix of, of what Mick wanted on the day. Um, so Monkey took him that day and, as I said, did a great job. Did he talk much on the field? Not a lot, no. Not a lot. I, I got him going a couple of times, but... Um, he was generally pretty quiet, yeah. What do you mean so he got him going? Was it, did you used to try to get players not focus on the game? Was that a part of the... Yeah, absolutely it was, yeah. The like, wish special. The yeah. more you could get them to, to not be thinking about trying to kick goals and beat you, the better. You know, get them thinking about, look, what an idiot you are or <laughs> um, whatever it is. If you can get their focus off the game, there's a slight advantage there for you. So, uh, But Ablett was one of those guys like... If he looks like calm, don't fire him up just because he, he might be just cruising around thinking, I might just try and kick one or two today. That'll do me. You know, it's my RDO. Um, <laughs> but if you fire him up and get him wanting to get the footy in, on he, in his hands just to show you up, like you could be in trouble. So generally I would uh, I'd try and read the mood, you know, and um, work out where we're going. But there were a few times when he cleaned teammates up and a couple where – I wasn't actually playing on him, so then I didn't care if I fired him up. Um, and I, I, I sort of went and had cracks at him after that had happened uh, and yeah, had said things to him that caught his attention, put it that way, and uh, got, a, got a pretty good reaction a couple of times. Um, yeah, he got angry a couple of times there. Yeah. This is so funny. Without ever talking to you about this properly, I literally just can't stop thinking about my time against players 
We're actually we actually doing exactly the same thing, which I used to just love talking shit to blokes. Not because I like talking shit. I actually don't. I'm, yeah. I'm quite insular and I don't really want to do it. But getting them going and seeing that reaction that you're talking about, you still remember. This is, this is 30 years ago, Wush. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's a part of the craft. And maybe we're losing it. I don't know. Maybe we're losing it in today's game. But back on 92 and 94, what's it like in town at that time? Um, premiership players... That Carl Langdon on the podcast a few weeks ago, whoosh. Um, Reckon he was rolling into, I don't know, what, what, what rumours and all these other <laughs> nightclubs. A few old, there's a few old laughs going on here, back here. Uh, in, your, in your, I was told you were heading into nightclubs, not you personally, in your tracksuits, in West Coast tracksuits. You'd go straight, straight there, that, no worries. That, that had happened. Yeah, <laughs> that had happened. We would travel back in our tracksuits and land at 11 o'clock at night. It was like, no time to go and get changed. Straight to a nightclub. <laughs> in like, and they were terrible tracks. Imagine um, that. Just roll it in the front door of the nightclub. No yeah. worries. West Coast team's here. Yeah. Yeah, no, that was, that's just how it was at the time. Um, yeah, you know, obviously after that, uh, that 92 win, the, the town had pretty much stopped to watch that game. If you can imagine how big it is now, even like 2018 grand final, what it meant to the town. But there's two teams in town. And, and there's been other premierships taken out of Victoria through uh, us and Sydney and Brisbane and Adelaide, Port Adelaide. But um, back then, no team outside Victoria had ever won a premiership. Mm. So this was big. And uh, when we won it, um, like, I don't know, I, I was pretty naive. I, I was like a nerd, just train hard. <laughs> Go to footy. I didn't go out a lot. I didn't know the. I didn't know places like this existed. You know, <laughs> um, I knew where a couple of nightclubs were. Um, but yeah, we were uh, going into pubs and just being fated. I, like I'm sure for the, for a couple of weeks, um, we didn't have to buy a drink. Um, the red carpet was rolled out. To, uh, people were trying to get us into their venues. You know, so um, yeah, it was a bit of an eye opener. Um, good fun. Um, and generally trouble free, I think. Yes. Uh, yeah. We um speaking of Carl Langdon, he told us about a time when um everyone pitched into bed on a first goal scorer. Um, do you remember that happening? Um, I don't remember that. No, <laughs> I remember betting on beating Brisbane in a game. Yeah. When, when you guys but, were playing. Yeah, we were playing Brisbane, and s- yeah. I don't think it was John, a John, This is John Todd. John Todd's yeah. spoken about this. Yeah. He was a coach, right? He was the. Pretty sure he was a coach, and and it was someone else that was on either the match committee. I can't remember exactly, but someone who liked betting, and said, "These are our odds to beat Brisbane. I reckon we're a Monty to beat them. Like, what are, what are the bookies doing?" That's like, and uh, someone went around and said, "Let's all put in whatever twenty bucks or something like that, and put some money on us," which we did, and we won. And then someone sillily. <laughs> like bragged about it, but they, they had the room. They had the cameras in the rooms post game. What they do, yeah. pr- rhyming Brian Taylor. I've seen the footage. Yeah. They go and speak to Toddy, and he goes, "Yeah, mate, we put a thousand bucks on us to win. No worries. <laughs> yeah, we done it. It was great." And then, and then it sort of cuts back to the news and He goes, and, and and Mr. Todd has said that uh, he was just joking. He was trying to um, entertain the players, and then it cuts back to the vision in the rooms. It's one of the boys going, "Yeah, I got my fifty bucks out of my bag. We chucked it straight on. One thousands of bucks. It was bloody unreal. Next player, next player. So you blokes have yeah. loaded up on yourself. Yeah, we did, and we won, and then uh, we got fined the exact amount of the winnings um, by the uh, VFL. Or the, I think it was the VFL. Um, and we might have the club might have got fined something as well. But you know, there were no, uh, from my recollection, there was. That probably what brought the rules in about gambling on, yeah. on footy in because, um, yeah, our understanding was there was no rules around it. But obviously, <laughs> lucky we won. Like, yeah. Lucky we didn't back Brisbane yeah. and they win. I think they're worried more about, you know, teams tanking and, and losing and, and yeah. throwing games. You blokes were just like, we're better than these blokes. We're going to yeah, beat yeah. them. No uh, more yeah. incentive. And I reckon we won by a mile too. Yeah. Probably because we put the money on. Yeah. Like, we fired up a bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So... 92, 94, couple of flags, incredibly successful period for the footy club. Um, you, you played on some of the greats during that time and huge matchups on players. Have you got memories about certain players, whether at Oppo or, or teammates, just great teammates or great opposition? Yeah, oh, I played with so many great teammates. Um, you'd have to you just reel off everyone who lined up in that mm-hmm. era. Um, but, yeah, opponents, obviously, playing... Uh, not far from Tony Lockett coming out of the goal square. 
Uh, you know, I was I was uh, five metres away when he knocked Bluey McKenna out cold, and he copped four weeks, I think, for that one. Um, that was the start. That was like I think 1988, Bluey's first year, I think, or second year in '89, maybe. But that was the start of um, Bluey getting a really bad habit of getting carried off on a stretcher, like he did it so many times. It was like <laughs> at least eight times, I reckon, <laughs> at least eight. Um, anyway, that was the first one. Uh, so that was one like, Bluey's only been in the squad for a year or two. Do I go and put my life on the line and go and have a crack a plugger? <laughs> or do I just go, I think it was an accident. Well, yeah. Life on the line. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, so, you know, plugger was just a freak. Dunst, all those guys, uh, I didn't play always directly on them, but watching our boys try and work on, uh, yeah, Jason Dunstall, Paul Salmon, some of these guys, um, obviously Ablett, Lockett. Um, and then you've got uh, Peter Dacos, um, who I played on a fair bit. Um, one of the other guys who's not as big a name, but was certainly as good a goal kicker was Paul Hudson, playing for uh, the Hawks, Hawks yeah. generally. Um, I think he ended up at the Bulldogs for a little while. Yep. Um, we had a pretty good rivalry. I, I call it pretty good. I think he says it was a terrible rivalry. <laughs> he hated it. But, um, yeah, uh, and, and the early days, playing on Dougie Hawkins or Robbie Flower, some of these big big champions of the game was uh, was pretty exciting. We had Dougie on last week, didn't we? It mm. was a very, very Legend. good chat. Had some good laughs with Dougie. What about the reputation of, of being a hard hitter, a ruthless Take no backward step. I know you personally, and 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 um, look, you're still scared of me to this day. I wish I used to struggle to walk into your coach's office, but <laughs> I also know you to the point where you don't walk around bumping blokes on the street. You are a kind, soft, soft, soft man inside somewhere. That that hard, <laughs> yeah. We're, we're, we think. Yeah, where is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Is that is that is that fair? That, that the stuff on the field was that was that a was that a above who you were as a person and was it something you tried to do, enforce, you know, physicality, be physical, yeah, make people take a backward step? It became something I did. Um, as a young kid, I played, I went hard at the footy, you know, I, I loved the contest, um, would shepherd hard, teammates protect them, um, tackle hard. So I loved all that stuff. Um, and then in the AFL, I just remember uh, in those early days with West Coast, there was so much commentary, whether it was a beat up media commentary, um, Victorian centric crowds, but talking about the fact that they, this West Australian group of players will not be able to play and cope with the smaller grounds, the heavy muddy grounds in Victoria. They'll be okay on that big wide open ground at Subiaco, which is always hard, but they will not be able to deal with the physicality of Victorian football. And, you know, I took a bit of offence to that. And uh, they did, um, when we played away, uh, and we were playing on the suburban ground, so playing at Moorabbin, small ground, mad crowd, just baying for blood. <laughs> and no doubt that lifted the St Kilda players to think, let's crack into these blokes. Like, we're at home. They're going to be so intimidated. Yeah. We copped it at Victoria Park with the Collingwood crowd, Windy Hill crowd. You know, there was that one game where someone from the crowd had Don Pike in a headlock over the fence. <laughs> you know, not, Actually. Not, not the male and picket just tapped him on the shoulder, eh? had him in a headlock. Um, so, actually, did that actually happen? Yeah, it did, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, when, when they took the cheap shots at us uh, in these suburban grounds and these rough, tough, the Saints or whoever it was, Pies, uh, I was not taking a backward step. I thought... We're going to show you that we're going to stand up for ourselves. Um, so from a from early days in that team, um, if anything had happened to me, I would stand up for myself. I'd fight back, and if anything happened to a teammate, I'd try and be first in to support them as well. So um, yeah, it was just making a statement that uh, you know that's it's not accurate the way you're talking about us, and it's not the way we're going to be. You were, you only were sent to the tribunal four times. Is that all? That's it. I've, I don't, not that you're a, not that you're a dirty player, but it just seems like for all the your, yeah. your hard hits and stuff, because yeah. you know, there's some great. One of them was for abusive language. Yeah, to the was, you got was it? What did you say? One and a half thousand dollars. What did you say? Oh, no, I can't repeat that. <laughs> it's like you don't get a fine now. Hey, the, just ask him if I he saw the, the um, saw the free kick. The age, I think it was the age newspaper printed 
the Verbatim. transcript of what I'd said, <laughs> and it was just all but blacked out. It was all asterisks and yeah. like, there was almost no there English, wasn't no English words in there, but. <laughs> It was directed at the umpire, so you can imagine what I was saying. You, you could fill in the blanks. But um, So you, you had two striking for two matches each, a $1,500 fine, and then no penalty for throat grabbing. Which is yeah. Throat grabbing. 1995. Is that choking, or is it just grabbing someone's against, throat? Do, do you know who? I, I, you all it know? says is 95 throat grabbing. I, could, I, I think that was Buddha hocking. Did, I'm was it? sure, yeah. Well, it was my juniors coach, Buddha. Good man. Yeah. No, he's a lovely bloke. A lovely bloke. He... Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I tackled him. I tackled him. A good tackle with the ball. And he sort of made this um, fake attempt to handball it out. So he just punched me in the head. Like, he just swung, punched me in the head. And as we went to the ground, he elbowed me in the face. So I got him pinned on the ground. And I, I actually ended up, like, I was almost doing a handstand on his throat. I had my whole body weight <laughs> on his neck on the ground. And he was starting to kick because he couldn't breathe. He was starting to kick out. And he was panicking. And... Uh, so he, I think in the end he thought the only way I'm out of this he's like trying to eye gouge me he's like ripping at my eyes and he got busted like he could see clearly I'm trying to pull my head away and my, his fingers are in my eyes and he got charged with misconduct for eye gouging and at that stage I wasn't charged with anything and then all of a sudden the media went oh well he's doing it because he's getting like choked we better charge the other bloke too so then I got charged with throat grabbing Throat grabbing. Yeah, yeah. So, You're yeah. choking him. Yeah, I know. It was self defence throat grabbing, so that should have been all right. You, but, you um, may have got off on that one because this says. No, we both got off. He got off the eye gouging um, thing with like clear picture. Like, would you both go to tribunal? No, sorry, it didn't, wasn't in my eye. I wasn't, like wasn't that. grabbing his throat. Yeah, so, I, I would have said, no, his finger's not really in my eye. You know, it's, I'm just making it look like it is. Yeah. <laughs> Round 13, 1995. Warsfold for grabbing G Hocking by the throat. That mm. was the, yeah, so, what a go. terrible thing to do. <laughs> So, uh, after you've grabbed Buddha's uh, throat, whiskers, uh, as he was known yep. as for a little while, um, 1998, you retire. After 207 games, you had some knee issues towards the back end. Were you ready, ready to retire? And, or were you... Yeah, I think I was. I was battling to get up week to week. Um, and yeah, it was hard work. It was hard work to uh, actually feel like I was fit enough for the next game. And... Um, Prior to the last home and away game against Adelaide, I went and saw Mick. I had a year left on my contract, uh, and I just went had a chat to Mick, and he said, how do you think you're going? And I said, I'm just hanging in there at the moment, and I don't know if I can go around again. And he said, I'm probably thinking the same. So we, we said, that'll be it. We, Mick and I had made a decision, we'll finish up uh, at the end of the year, but we were still a chance to play finals. So I said, well, let's, we're not going to announce anything. Let's just sit on that until the season finishes. So we didn't announce anything. We played um, Adelaide in the last home and away game. So it was, that was quite emotional, actually, because I was playing on Subi Oval knowing if we lost, we could miss the finals, and that would be my last ever game on Subi. Um, and if we won, we were going to scrape in the finals. We weren't getting a home final. So either way, it was my last ever game in front of my home crowd, which, which I loved. No one, uh, no one knew that? But no one knew. No, not even my teammates. No one knew. So... Um, Anyway, we, we lost, so it was, I was thinking, well, that's it. And, but we only just lost, and then the results went our way, and we ended up scraping into the finals. So we were then going to play the next week against the Bulldogs at the MCG. And uh, Mick spoke to me during the week, like he always did, and he said, how are you going? You reckon you're going to be right? And I said, I think so. I think I'll, I'll be able to give you what I've been giving you. So I've been starting on the bench. Um, but it was a final, so Mick had, a, had an attitude about how fit you needed to be in finals. So... Uh, you know, later in the week when we got to Melbourne, he made a final decision that he didn't think I was fit enough to play. And, you know, I was fine with it. I know what coaches have to go through to make those calls. Um, but it got blown up a little bit. Like, uh, he shouldn't have done it. We lost. You know, we lost. If we had have won, people probably wouldn't have cared if, if I hadn't have played or not. But yeah. because we lost, people then... And, we, and I announced my retirement, I think, the following week or maybe a week after that... Um, Fans got a bit annoyed that didn't get that chance to uh, either have a farewell game. I'm not really sure actually what they wanted, but um, yeah, there was no, there was no real issue there from from my behalf. You're pretty tight with Mick. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, pretty tight. Yeah, you would have been definitely. A, I mean, you you captain in his first year and you captain throughout his coaching career effectively. Uh, a mentor? Do you look back on your time under him as 
Yeah, I you thought learn, you learn a lot. You go on to be a yeah, head coach. Yeah, absolutely. We we work. <clears throat> I think I work really strongly with Mick to support what he wanted to put in place for the team. Doesn't mean I got it right all the time, but um, I was very focused on keeping the group uh, playing to the philosophies that Mick wanted us to play to. So on the ground, we were a very defensively focused team. It was keeping the boys switched on to defend hard the whole time. While we were still, when we had the footy, we would go hard and, and attack, but. Um, very quickly we'd bounce back into our defensive mindset. So, yeah, the fact that, um, you know, uh, I was captain all the way through um, my whole career uh, uh, under Mick um, shows that we, we had a pretty good working relationship. Did, did he ever, when you were playing under him, mention to you that you would be a good coach in the future? Was that ever a sort of a conversation? I think so, no. Like, no um, Wanted to keep his job. <laughs> I don't remember talking about that, but, you know, I was, uh, I was all the way through my career, I was working... Um, some hours in pharmacy. Um, so having studied pharmacy and working in that, um, you know, my expectation was um, that once I retired, I'd be a pharmacist. That was going to be my career after footy. But I did that for the first year after I retired, but um, missed the game a fair bit and then um, looked yeah, for an opportunity to get back involved as a coach.